Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to have you here again. It hardly seems possible that an entire week has gone by since I arrived here in Oklahoma City. I want to express my appreciation for attending. Remember that tomorrow we have three sessions, one at 11, one at 5, and the other one at 7. So we're going to close with a bang, so to speak. Now, before we get into our study this evening, which is the message to Philadelphia part 2, uh, we want to have a word of prayer, and then I want to make an explanation. So let's bow our heads for prayer, and then I will give you the explanation. Father in heaven, thank you for the promise of your presence. We claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last night, a very incisive question was asked by one of the church members here. That question was, how can you prove these things that you've been talking about without using the spirit of prophecy? If you want to, in other words, if you want to share it with a person who is not an Adventist. Very good question. And it's not the first time that that question has been asked to me. So let me just explain so that it's on the record. I want it to be on the record. I want it to be on the production so that people out there on television can see the explanation. Uh, when it comes, for example, to Daniel chapter 7, can we see in Scripture that the line represents Babylon? Yeah, the Bible itself tells us, right? You know, Daniel is in Babylon. That's the first kingdom. Can we be sure that the next kingdom is Medo-Persia? Yeah, Daniel chapter 5 says the Medes and Persians conquered Babylon. Can we be sure that the third kingdom is Greece? Yes, Daniel chapter 8 says that the third kingdom is Greece. Can we determine from Scripture that the next kingdom is Rome? Yeah, in Revelation chapter uh, 12, we have the great dragon that tries to slay the child when he's born. That has to be the Roman Empire. And so when it comes to the first four kingdoms of Daniel 7, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon, there's no problem because the Bible itself interprets it. The problem is when we go beyond the period of the canon of Scripture. Like for example, the ten horns that sprout on the head of the dragon beast after the dragon beast rules for a while. And then, even more complicated, the little horn that rises among the ten. The little horn rises over 500 years after the New Testament canon was closed. So, how do we know that the little horn represents the papacy? The Bible doesn't say it. We can't figure it out by looking at the sequence of powers. We have to look at the characteristics of the little horn and then look for a power in history that fits all of the characteristics and it fits the papacy. So when something goes beyond the canon of scripture, beyond the time in which the canon was closed, we then depend on looking at the characteristics and then looking for the power that meets the characteristics. Amen. Let me give you another example. We believe that the beast that rises from the earth, that has two horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon, represents the United States of America. Can we be sure that it's the United States of America? Do you find any verse in the Bible that says, this beast is the United States of America? No. no. So how do we know it's the United States of America? It's beyond the biblical canon. It's, it's almost 2,000 years after the New Testament period. So what do we do? We look at the characteristics of this beast that rises from the earth. And then, once we have the characteristics, we look for a power that fits all of the characteristics. Are you with me? Yes. We do the same thing with what we've been studying concerning the churches. We look for the characteristics of each church, and then we look in history at the church or the, or the period that fits those characteristics. By the way, Somebody like Hal Lindsey, who is a dyed-in-the-wool uh, dyed futurist, he has no problem saying, well, Ephesus is the apostolic church, and Smyrna is the church persecuted by the Roman emperors, and the church of, uh, the church of uh, Pergamum is the period of Constantine, the church of uh, Thyatira represents the papal church, the church of Sardis represents the church of the Protestant Reformation, when the church, Protestant Reformation became stagnant. In other words, he has no problem in identifying, he's not an Adventist, and he identifies what periods each church represents. What is he doing? 
He's looking at the characteristics and he's looking at the fulfillment in history. By the way, it's very, very important for us to take into account the testimony of Ellen White. Why can we use Ellen White when we talk about the Church of Philadelphia? Because she was in that church. She lived the experience of the Church of Philadelphia. She was an eyewitness. She was a participant. So would she be particularly important in knowing how this was fulfilled in the 1830s and 1840s? Absolutely. Why would we exclude her when she was an eyewitness and a participant in this movement? So we should not be intimidated by people saying, oh, prove it only from the Bible. No, because there's lots of things in prophecy that you can't prove from the Bible. You have to go to history and then look for the characteristics in the Bible. Are you with me or not? Yes. Very important point. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 to 13. We're going to read the message to the church of Philadelphia again. And I'm going to add some remarks as we go along. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. What door is that? Where does that door lead according to what we studied in our first uh, lecture? It represents the door that leads into the most holy place. Then it says, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Is that true of the faithful in the church of Philadelphia? Those who were faithful in the Millerite movement? Yes. Absolutely. Now, it says in verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews, by the way, we're talking about spiritual Jews, spiritual Jews are Christians, right? Yes. So, these are individuals who claim to be Christians, and they are what? They are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. That has not happened yet. Because the synagogue of Satan, the apostate churches in 1844 did not do this. This must mean that the church of Philadelphia has a future dimension. Now let's continue. Verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, actually it's the, from the hour of temptation, Satan is going to launch his temptations against the church during the time of trouble, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Did that happen in 1844? The whole world was tested with, with these temptations? Absolutely not. Does that indicate that the message to Philadelphia must have a future dimension, a broader dimension? Absolutely. Verse 11. Jesus is speaking to those who go through the time of trouble that will come upon the whole world. He says to them, Behold what? I am coming quickly. In other words, the tribulation is going to last a short period of time. The time of temptation is going to last a short time. So it says, Jesus is speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. And then comes the promise, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now do you remember in our last study that we read a statement from the book Great Controversy where Ellen White described this movement as the most perfect movement, the most free of human imperfection since apostolic times, what happened in the 1830s? Absolutely. And yet Ellen White continues saying something very interesting. This is Great Controversy 424 and 425. But the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord. Wow. They prayed all night. They interceded with their relatives. They left their potatoes in the field. They wept because of their sins. I mean, this was a tremendous revival. How can Ellen White say the people were not yet ready to meet their Lord? She continues, There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished for them. See, Jesus is going to accomplish the work for them. Light was to be given. 
directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven, and as they should by faith follow their high priest in his ministration there, that is in the most holy place, new duties would be revealed. Another message of warning and instruction was to be given to the church. She continues, Those who are living upon the earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Is that true of the Millerites? That they had to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator? No, because Jesus was still interceding in the heavenly sanctuary. But this is talking about the end time generation. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investi now here comes the key point. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14, that is, the three angels' message. And then she ends the statement by saying, when this work shall have been accomplished, in other words, when Jesus cleanses the sanctuary from the sins of his people, because they have cleansed the soul temple from sin, she says, when this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. I want to read another statement. Great Controversy, page 623. Ellen White wrote, Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his Father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. And then comes the conclusion. This is the condition in which those must be, those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Not even by a thought. Now regarding the Millerites, Ellen White had this to say. You see, did the Millerites keep the Sabbath? No. Did they believe that the dead are dead? No. Did they believe that there are certain things that we're not supposed to eat because we're supposed to take care of our body temple? Did they believe that, uh, that when a person dies, they're in the grave until they're judged, and then they're either punished with fire that goes out, or they're rewarded with heaven? No, they believe in an eternally burning hell. Did they have a lot to learn? Yes. Did they know that Jesus was, had gone into the most holy place to cleanse the, cleanse the sanctuary from the sins of the people and that they needed in parallel fashion to cleanse the temple of the soul? Did they know that? No. They knew none of that. Was there still something they needed to learn in preparation for the big time of trouble after the close of probation when they had to live without an intercessor? Absolutely. I want to read this statement about the Millerites. Jesus bade his angels go and strengthen them, for the hour of their trial drew on. See, that's Philadelphia language, isn't it? But it's referring to the Millerites. The hour of their trial drew on. I saw that these waiting ones were not yet tried as they must be. In other words, they were not tested as they must be. They were not free from errors. And I saw the mercy and goodness of God in sending a warning to the people of the earth and repeated messages to lead them to a diligent searching of heart and study of the scriptures that they might divest themselves of errors which have been handed down from the heathens and the papists. Through these messages God has been bringing out his people where he can work for them in greater power and where they can keep all his 
commandments. So you'll notice here that the new duties are found in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. In other words, during the judgment, the distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist church would come to view. Do you know that the truths of the most holy place are the points of controversy that will exist in the Christian world at the end of time? What do we find in the most holy place? Are the Ten Commandments in the most holy place? Yes. yes. What do the Protestant churches say? Nailed to the cross. We're not under law, but we're under grace. Which is true, but you have to understand what it means. Let me ask you, what is in the center of the law? The Sabbath. Does the Protestant world keep the Sabbath? No. Is that going to be a point of controversy? Yes. By the way, when did the judgment begin? In 1844. Who was the first one to be judged? Adam. We already studied that, right? The first ones who lived was the one who was judged. Now let me ask you this. How could God judge Adam in 1844 if Adam was whisked off to heaven when he died? You see, if you believe that you go to heaven when you die, a judgment in 1844 means nothing. Why would God judge you in 1844 if at your death He had already given you your reward by taking you to heaven? Does the Protestant world believe that the judgment is taking place now in the heavenly sanctuary and they must cleanse the temple of the soul? No, they believe that the judgment is when you die. If you were good, you go to heaven. If you were bad, you go to hell. Or they might say, well, the judgment is when Jesus comes again because He's coming to judge the living and the dead. Are you following me? The distinctive truths of the Adventist church are found in the most holy place. And that's the reason why our pioneers, when they entered by faith with Jesus into the most holy place, they said, now wait a minute, the law is in the most holy place. Then it wasn't nailed to the cross. In the center of the law is the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath couldn't have been abolished either. And also, the idea that the judgment begins in 1844 means that nobody was judged when they died. And then they looked at the pot of manna which God wanted to use to teach health reform. They said, there are certain habits that we need to get rid of to have a clear mind. They started discovering all of these truths that are found and encased in the most holy place, which will be the points of conflict between the remnant and the world at the end of time. Ellen White explained in the book Early Writings, page 256, how important the three angels' messages are. She wrote, these messages were represented to me as an anchor to the people of God. Those who understand and receive them will be kept. Is that an expression that is used for Philadelphia? Yes, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. So if they receive them and understand them, they will be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. In other words, by the many temptations of Satan. Sadly, folks, many Seventh-day Adventists at that time who have based their religious experience on superficial things such as signs and wonders, feelings, emotions, felt needs, excitement, upbeat worship services, and so on, will have no anchor to hold them. Because what's going to hold you is the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. Amen. It is the Word of God that's going to carry you through. Now let me read you from Great Controversy, page 620, where Ellen White talks about people who were professed Christian, Christians that reached this period without the necessary preparation. She wrote, Those professed Christians who come up to that last fearful conflict unprepared will in their despair confess their sins in words of burning anguish while the wicked exult over their distress. These confessions are of the same character as was that of Esau or of Judas. Those who make them lament the result of transgression, but not its guilt. Let me ask you, is the door of the most holy place going to be opened again for the world to see something that is going to happen? Absolutely. Now you say, what is it that's going to happen that the world is going to go into the most holy place and they're going to see? Well, What's going to happen is the judgment of the living. You see, in 1844, the Millerites did not understand this, but the Millerites were actually announcing that the hour of God's judgment had come. But as we know, 
it was the judgment of the righteous dead that began in 1844. The judgment of the living would take place at the very end of human history. They still did not understand this. The message that uh, God gave to the remnant church is that at the end of human history there is going to be a judgment of the living. Jesus is going to do a new work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He's going to cleanse the sanctuary from sin. No longer is He only going to cleanse uh, sinners from their sin in their lives, but He's actually going to cleanse the sins of the righteous from the sanctuary out. And all cases will have been decided. Now let me ask you, every time that Jesus begins a new function, is there a powerful announcement? I mentioned this before. Is there a powerful announcement letting people know that Jesus is beginning a new phase of ministry? Was there an announcement when Jesus was born? Yes. yes, the wise men from the east and the shepherds in the field, the angels that sang. Was there an announcement when Jesus was about to begin His public ministry? John the Baptist. Was there a powerful event that attracted all eyes to Jesus in the last week before He died? Palm Sunday. The coming of Jesus into Jerusalem triumphantly on a donkey. Was there a powerful announcement when Jesus began His work in the holy place on the day of Pentecost? Yeah. Peter preached a powerful sermon. Yeah. There were tongues of fire and there was a mighty rushing wind and everybody started speaking in languages that they never studied before. The angels put a Rosetta Stone in their brain, so to speak. Was there a powerful announcement when Jesus was going to begin the judgment of the dead in 1844? Yes, it was the Millerite movement. We studied about that in our last presentation. Do you just suppose that there might be some event on earth that will announce that the judgment of the living is beginning or about to begin? That's right. There must be. Now let's take a look at some quotations from Ellen White about the judgment of the living. By the way, I'm not setting any date for the beginning of the judgment of the living. Some are doing that. We cannot know the date. But by the event, we can know that the judgment of the living is beginning or about to begin because the judgment of the living will take place when the issue over the seal of God or the mark of the beast is taking place because once people make a decision to receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast then they will be judged alive. Notice this statement that we find in the book The Faith I Live By page 211. Ellen White wrote, The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. She's writing this in 1911. For many years this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. In the great controversy, page 490, she wrote, the judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass through the cases of the living. She also wrote in the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 446, The same angel who visited Sodom is sounding the note of warning. Escape for thy life. The bottles of God's wrath cannot be poured out to destroy the wicked and their works until all the people of God have been judged and the cases of the living as well as the dead are decided. Jesus cannot close the door of probation until everybody has decided for the seal of God or the mark of the beast, then probation will close, because all of the living will have been judged. She continues writing, And even after the saints are sealed with the seal of the living God, His elect will have trials individually. Don't think that just because they're sealed, it's going to be a cakewalk. No way. She continues, personal afflictions will come, but the furnace is closely watched by an eye that will not suffer the gold to be consumed. The indelible mark of God is upon them. God can plead, plead that His own name is written there. And now notice the reference to the Philadelphian message. She says, the Lord has shut them in. Their destination is inscribed, God, New Jerusalem. Is that the name that is placed on the forehead of the people of Philadelphia? Absolutely. She says, they are God's property, His possession. Now if Jesus is going to begin the judgment of the living in heaven, do you just suppose that there needs to be an earthly announcement to that effect? Absolutely. 
Where is that announcement in the Bible? It's found in Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 4. This is the message that is going to polarize the world into two groups where everybody will make their decision and then people will be judged on the basis of their decision while they are alive. It says there in Revelation 18 1, after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen and has become, now notice the condition of Babylon, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. That is the call to come out of Babylon. And when people come out of Babylon, there will be people that will leave the remnant church as well. There will be coming in, and there will be a going out. People will make irrevocable decisions, not because God pronounces sentence, but because they decide. And then God will judge everyone while they are alive. The midnight cry of 1844 will be repeated on a grander global scale. I want to read a statement from Story of Redemption, page 399 and 400. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And then she explains what this text that she just quoted means, Revelation 18 verses 4 and 5. This message seemed to be, be an addition to the third message. Joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints, and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon, and calling upon God's people to come out of her, that they might escape her fearful doom. So it must be understood then that the first angel's message is going to be proclaimed once more, when Jesus begins his work of judgment of the living in the heavenly sanctuary. 1844 will be repeated on a much larger scale. Now let's take a look at another statement from the Spirit of Prophecy where she compares the, the midnight cry of the Millerites with the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18. She's referring to Revelation 18 verses 1 through 5. This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 is to be repeated. Is the second angel's message going to be repeated? Absolutely. She says, with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that con constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. So not only is the message of 1844 going to preach, but there's going to be a preaching of additional things that have come into the Christian church since then, additional apostasy. Then she says this, a terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infidel hardihood. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue, until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the contempt placed upon His Word and His people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed and the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basest iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. Is that similar to what took place in 1844? You read early writings. Ellen White describes uh, 
false revivals that existed in 1844. You know, people spoke in tongues and they rolled on, in the aisles of the church and they shouted hallelujah. And they had, all, they, they had all of these emotional worship services. And they thought that it was of God. But really the message that was given by God was the message that was presented by the Millerites. Now, is the loud cry going to be extremely powerful? It is, is it going to shake up the world and polarize the world? Absolutely. Notice early writings, page 278 and 279. I saw that this message will close with power and strength, far exceeding the midnight cry. The midnight cry is the cry that the judgment was about to begin October 22, 1844. But Ellen White says that the message of Revelation 18, 1 through 4 will exceedingly pass the power of the midnight cry. Servants of God, now she's going to describe it, servants of God endowed with power from on high, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, went forth to proclaim the message from heaven. Souls that were scattered all through the religious bodies answered to the call. And, pre and the precious were hurried out of the doomed churches as Lot was hurried out of Sodom before her destruction. God's people were strengthened by the excellent glory which rested upon them in rich abundance and prepared them to endure, now listen to the message of Philadelphia, and prepared them to endure the hour of temptation. I heard everywhere a multitude of voices saying, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Are multitudes going to come out of Babylon when the loud cry is given? Yes. Did multitudes come out of the apostate churches in 1844 in the eastern United States? Yes, but at the end of time it's not going to be the eastern United States. It is going to be a global message and multitudes will come out of the apostate churches. Let me read you another statement, Great Controversy 464. Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. Don't just trash the churches and say, oh, everything in those churches is bad. Their doctrines are not biblical doctrines, but there are many sincere loving people in every church. Yes. In fact, I believe that most of God's true people are in the Roman Catholic Church but they don't know that they're in the wrong church. But when this message is given, the loud cry, inviting them to come out when they realize that the harlot is the papacy and the daughters are apostate Protestant churches and that the kings of the earth are allied with the mother and the daughters, they'll say, I'm not even going to think it twice. I'm out of here. They just don't know it right now. She continues, Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. This is going to even surpass the revival in 1844, which was the greatest since apostolic times. She continues, The Spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children. At that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted the love for God and His Word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. Are you looking forward to that day? By the way, many Seventh-day Adventists who have a superficial relationship with Christ, at that time they're going to leave. You know, when persecution comes, you can tell who's who. You know, when in times of prosperity, people just love to come to church and, you know, they love to hobnob with everybody. But when it comes to persecution, you can tell who really is allied to Jesus and who is not. Now, let's read Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, which is part of the message to Philadelphia. Because you have kept my command to persevere, that's an important word, the word hupomone, which means to persevere, to hang in there, to persist, to endure. Because you have kept my command to persevere, what does God promise? I will keep you from the hour of trial. That's the big tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And then 
this time of trouble is not going to last very long because it says, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. In this time of trial that's coming upon the world, what is being said by Jesus is, Hang in there. Don't give up. Persevere. Endure. Persist. Maintain your relationship with Jesus. Incidentally, that word, because you have kept my command to persevere, is the identical word that is used in Revelation 13 verse 10. Right before the beast rises from the earth to cause the final crisis, it says, here is the patience and faith of the, faith of the saints. Right before they enter the final tribulation. It's the same word that is used at the end of the third angel's message after speaking about the beast, his image, and his mark. Where it says, here is the patience. It means the endurance, the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus will cut this period short, folks. It says in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. That's why Jesus says to those who will go through the tribulation that will fall upon the whole world, He says, I come quickly. Amen. Notice Isaiah 54 verses 7 and 8. This is speaking about this tribulation period as well. God says, for a mere moment I have forsaken you, speaking about His people, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And you say, you mean God is going to withdraw uh, His uh, face from us for a moment? Well, you know, Jesus went through that first, didn't He? Didn't He cry out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course He did. Was the Father there? The Father was there. Did Jesus perceive that the Father was there? No. Is God going to be there during the tribulation? Yes. Of course. Are we going to perceive it? No. We're not going to perceive it. So this text is saying God is going to withdraw His face for a moment, but He's going to be watching us and He's going to be protecting us. It's going to be like this widow in the story of the widow, the judge, and the adversary. The adversary wiped her out, took everything from her, but she kept on coming and coming and coming to the judge. And so finally the judge says, I'm going to do what she's asking for. The same with Job. Job from chapter 3 all the way to chapter 38 saying, Lord, why has this happened to me? Give me an explanation. Let me go before your, before your seat. I'll be able to explain my integrity. And he's talking and talking and talking. Finally, at the end of the book, God answers Job and rewards him with double of what he had before. That's what we're talking about. By the way, as I mentioned, there will be a shaking among God's people. I want to read a couple of statements here from the Spirit of Prophecy at this point. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when His law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in, in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. When the what? Majority. When the majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, listen carefully, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, 136. Maranatha, page 200, the devotional book, Ellen White speaks about Adventists who became identified with the world in times of prosperity. She wrote, The mark of the beast will be urged upon us, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands. It doesn't happen overnight, folks. Going into the world, becoming worldly does not happen overnight. So it says, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. In this time the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be clearly distinguished 
from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff like a cloud will be burn away, borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. Do you remember that in the church of Philadelphia the synagogue of Satan is already mentioned? What characterizes the synagogue of Satan? The spirit of prophecy says two things. Number one, the idea that we don't need to keep God's law. And number two, the idea that when people die, their soul goes to heaven. Let me read you these two statements. Testimonies to Ministers, page 16. Satan has a large confederacy, his church. Christ calls them the synagogue of Satan because the members are the children of sin. The members of Satan's church have been constantly working to cast off the divine law and confuse the distinction between good and evil. Makes me think of churches who say that gay marriage is all right. Gay clergy is all right. Large mainline churches casting off the divine law. She continues, Satan is working with great power in and through the children of disobedience to exalt treason and apostasy as truth and loyalty. And at this time, the power of his satanic inspiration is moving the living agencies to carry out the great rebellion against God that commenced in heaven. Why would people attack God's law? Why would they say, oh, we're not under law, we're under grace, we don't have to keep the law, Christ kept, this for us, kept it for us, you know the law was nailed to the cross. None of those things are true according to the Bible. We are not saved by keeping the law, but those who are saved will delight to keep the law, like David says in Psalm 119. Notice evangelism, page 603. This is the other error that characterizes the synagogue of Satan. Evangelism 603, the doctrine of consciousness after death, of the spirits of the dead being in communion with the living, has no foundation in the scriptures, and yet these theories are affirmed as truth. Through this false doctrine, the way has been opened for the spirits of devils to deceive the people in representing themselves as the dead. Satanic agencies personate the dead and thus bring souls into captivity. Satan has a religion. He has a synagogue and devout worshipers. To swell the ranks of his devotees, he uses all manner of deception. Does Satan know that a true revival is right around the corner? Yes, he knows that. He's listening to my sermon right now. If he's not here personally, his angels are taking a record and they're telling him exactly what I'm saying. He knows that this revival is going to come, that the judgment of the living is going to begin. There's going to be a public proclamation inviting those faithful people to come out of the churches and join the remnant church. He knows that many in the Adventist church will leave. Ellen White says the majority. So the devil says, I'm going to have to institute a counterfeit before the genuine comes. In fact, let me read you from the book Great Controversy, page 464. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. That is the powerful proclamation of the loud cry. He wants to hinder that because he doesn't want his people to come out of the churches. So it says, the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. So the counterfeit comes before the genuine. She continues, in those churches he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Ellen White also wrote in early writings, page 261, I saw that God has honest children among the nominal Adventists, those are Adventists in name, and the fallen churches. And before the plague shall be poured out, 
ministers and people will be called out from these churches and will gladly receive the truth. Satan knows this. And before the loud cry of the third angel is given, see this is what we're talking about, not the midnight cry of 1844, the hour of his judgment has come, but the judgment of the living, it says before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he raises an excitement in these religious bodies. Wow, that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Amen. Now, Amen. what will characterize these false religious revivals, these counterfeit revivals? What will they be characterized by? Ellen White in Great Controversy 463 described what these false revivals will involve. She says, but many of the revivals of modern times have presented a marked contrast to those manifestations of divine grace which in earlier days followed the labors of God's servants. It is true that a widespread interest is kindled. Many profess conversion. And there are large, large accessions to the churches. Lots of people coming to church. You look, for example, at Joe Osteen, 20,000, three or four services on Sunday. You look at all these Protestant churches, they're, they're maxed out. And so people say, they have to be of the Lord. Really? How many were faithful in the days of Noah? In a world that had millions? Eight. The minority is with God, not the majorities. It's not the size of the church or the number of members or the number of programs that the church has. It's the message that the church proclaims. She continues writing, It is true that a widespread interest is kindled. Many profess conversion and there are large accessions to the churches. Nevertheless, the results are not such as to warrant the belief that there has been a corresponding increase in real spiritual life. The light which flares, flames up for a time soon dies out leaving the darkness more dense than before. And then she describes popular revivals. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message which appeals to awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. So the competition is between the emotional, exciting worship services and the word of God. And there will be few who will follow the word of God. Now, do you remember that in, in the Millerite movement, the clergy were foremost in opposing the message? Great Controversy, page 607, Ellen White wrote, As the controversy extends into new fields, and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. And when everybody has made their decision, either for God's Sabbath, honoring the authority of the Creator, or the mark of the beast, honoring the authority of the beast, when everybody has made a final irrevocable decision, Jesus will say, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Probation will close and the time of trouble will begin. Ellen White uses Philadelphia language to describe this time of trouble. In the Great Controversy, page 560, Ellen White wrote, Just before us is the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelation 3 verse 10, all whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God 
will be deceived and overcome. Satan works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to gain control of the children of men, and his deceptions will continually increase. But he can gain his, objects, his object only as men voluntarily yield to his temptations. Those who are earnestly seeking a knowledge of the truth and are striving to purify their souls through obedience, thus doing what they can to prepare for the conflict, will find in, God, in the God of truth a sure defense. And now notice the verse that she quotes. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee, is the Savior's promise. That comes from the Philadelphia message. He would sooner send every angel out of heaven to protect his people than leave one soul that trusts in him to be overcome by Satan. Will God's people ultimately be delivered? Yes. You remember that uh, the scriptures tell us that the synagogue of Satan will come and bow before the feet of the saints and they will say, God truly loved you. Listen to these two quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy. Early Writings, page 15. The 144,000, those who are alive when Jesus comes, will, were all sealed and perfectly united. On their foreheads was written, God, New Jerusalem. That's the message of Philadelphia. And a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. That's promise to the church of Philadelphia. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison when we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord and they would fall helpless to the ground. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan, mentioned in the context of the church of Philadelphia, the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss and they worship at our feet. That's going to happen with the 144,000 which shows that the Philadelphian message has a future dimension, not only a past dimension, because in 1844 those who criticized the Millerites did not come to worship before the feet of the Millerites. Another statement, early writings, page 124, Ellen White describes what's going to happen with the false religious leaders. She says, I saw that the priests who are leading on their flock to death are soon to be arrested in their dreadful career. The plagues of God are coming, but it will not be sufficient for these false shepherds to be tormented with one or two of these plagues. God's hand at that time will be stretched out still in wrath and justice and will not be brought to himself again until his purposes are fully accomplished and the hireling priests are led to worship at the feet of the saints and to acknowledge that God has loved them because they held fast to the truth and kept God's commandments and until all the unrighteous ones are destroyed from the earth. Interesting. Once again, Philadelphia language. And she's saying that the synagogue of Satan are the hireling priests and the false shepherds. That is what is referred to as the synagogue of Satan. Now the final point that I want to cover is that this judgment is taking place during the church of Laodicea, which we will discuss in two parts tomorrow. Amen. Do you know what the word Laodicea means? It means judging the people. So the door is placed before Philadelphia in 1844. Ellen White and the pioneers, when they understand the reason for the disappointment, they enter through the door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And what do they enter there to do? They see that Jesus is in the process of cleansing the sanctuary from the sins of the people. And they saw the need to cleanse the sanctuary of the soul, the sanctuary of the heart, because Jesus is not going to cleanse anything up there that has not been cleansed here. Amen. Are you with me or not? They understood that they needed to carry on a parallel work on earth. They needed to draw close to Jesus, behold Jesus, and have the temple of the soul cleansed. That's the reason why, we'll notice tomorrow, the message to the church of Laodicea. Jesus says to Laodicea, which represents all of Christianity, but primarily the Seventh-day Adventist church, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. 
let me in so I can clean you out. Interesting that Jesus is outside the church of Laodicea. He's not inside. He's knocking. He said, let me in. Why does he want to come in? He wants to come in to expel all of the filth that we have in our hearts. Now let me read this last statement on this particular point. Sanctified Life, page 83. The more we contemplate the character of Christ, and the more we experience of His saving power, the more keenly shall we realize our own weakness and imperfection, and the more earnestly shall we look to Him as our strength and our Redeemer. We have no power in ourselves to cleanse the soul temple from its defilement, but as we repent of our sins against God and seek pardon through the merits of Christ, He will impart that faith which works by love and purifies the heart. By faith in Christ and obedience to the law of God we may be sanctified and thus obtain a fitness for the society of holy angels and the white robed redeemed ones in the kingdom of glory. Now in the next study together we're going to deal with the church of Laodicea in two parts. The first part we're going to study the disease of Laodicea. We're going to diagnose the disease that Laodicea has. Jesus has nothing good to say about Laodicea. You can read the whole message. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Jesus says nothing good about Laodicea. There's no, oh I commend you for this. No, no, no. Everything is negative. And we're going to see what the disease is. What, was, what is Laodicea's problem? But the good news is that at 5 o'clock in the afternoon we're going to study the remedy for the disease. And so we're not going to stop just by saying, hey, you got cancer, tough luck. No, we're going to see what the disease is and how that disease can be cured. Amen. And by the way, when the message to Laodicea ends its work, there will no longer be any lukewarm Christians. The Laodicean message will polarize the world into those who are hot or those who are cold. There will be no Laodicea when Jesus comes. There will only be Philadelphians, according to what we studied in our topic tonight. So did you understand what we studied this evening? Does the message of Philadelphia have a twofold application, a restricted one and a broader one? Yes, and we are members of the church in the fulfillment of the broader one. May God help us to be faithful Philadelphians.